A killer is striking at random. Why haven't you stopped up and down and shouted from the rooftops? He's got the wrong person. No comment. The chilling voice of Levi Belfield in custody. Police want to know, is he the man responsible for the murder of young blonde girls, multiple rapes, and one more attempted murder? He should run all over me. He ran over you twice. Yeah. <laughs> and I really hurt. There was a real palpable feeling of fear amongst women and girls in, in South West London at that time. He specialised in young victims. He was simply killing blonde young women for pleasure. His actions brought one of the world's mightiest news organisations to its knees with the murder. Levi Belfield has issues. His father dies when he's a child. Levi grows very close to his mother. His mother is a very important, this matriarchal figure in his life. Levi is tiny, at 16, still shorter than five feet tall. His physique makes him feel unattractive to girls at a West London comprehensive school, and he's profoundly miserable. He didn't want to be small. He wanted it to be... He was the front of the family, I think. Belfield was a woman hater. He was bullied at school um, quite, quite acutely by a number of girls, and he, uh, perhaps that was the, uh, you know, one of the causes of his loathing for women. By his late teens, Levi Belfield decides to change things. And in his later years, he took steroids, and in fact, the first time I ever saw him, his, uh, his arm muscles, his leg muscles were absolutely huge, and his neck was, was, was bulked up beyond all belief. He wanted to be the man, but he didn't want to be the little boy anymore. Some find his new look attractive. Belfield was to marry four times, have 11 children. One woman in his life was to experience both profound menace and how much fun he could be. He was the life and soul of the parties. He was the top dog. He was the one that everyone wanted to be with, everyone wanted to be seen around. He was like the, the don of like the area. Pete Rodriguez was to become a pivotal figure in Belfield's life as a friend and a colleague. Oh, I haven't got no brothers or sisters or anything like that. Uh, maybe it's, it's unconsciously knowing I've got a bigger sort of brother, in a sense, looking out for you, you know, because that's the impression he'd give you, he'd be looking out for you. But Rodriguez would soon carry the scars, emotionally and physically, of having Levi Belfield as an older brother figure. There are deeply unsettling sides to Levi, which occasionally appear. After a couple of drinks, he would get aggressive. He'd start off enjoyable, then he end up being a nightmare. He rather goes to try and beat up somebody. Belfield takes that aggression home. His first wife leaves him after one particularly savage beating, and his next partner quickly sees the steroid-induced muscle man's violent side. I bite you, burn you, kick you, punch you. Remember he split the back of my head open once, because he was fixing, doing something to the car, and I didn't answer him quickly enough and he had a tool in his hand and he just turned around and as I walked away, he hit me straight in the back of the head and split all my head open down there. That was one of the times. Particularly unsettling for Joe is her husband's irrational hatred of blonde women. When you find a magazine and all, only the blondes' faces are slashed and, you know, he's got, he goes mad. And when I fronted him about it, I mean, he, I really got a good hide in that day. And he, like, he told me straight, he said, I hate blondes. They're all fucking slags and they should die. And I don't know if it's because his mum's got jet black hair and she is the matriarch of the family and she rules with an iron rod. Or somewhere along the line, a blondes really hurt him or something like that. He just 
loathed women. And for some reason, he loathed women who are blonde. And on top of that, he seemed to loathe women who were young. Belfield's loathing of young girls doesn't stop him wanting to have sex with them. An ambition he can pursue in a job he gets at a nightclub. He became a bouncer, I think, because it was a regular supply of eager, young schoolgirls who would line up outside the clubs he was the bouncer at. He seemed to take it as a badge of honour that he was targeting girls who were legally beneath the age of consent. Belfield would never stand trial for some of the offences he was alleged to have committed against young girls. He would leave no DNA trace as he forced himself on some of the girls that he comes across. He was someone who kept a mattress in the back of one of his vans whereby he would sometimes ply girls with ketamine, a very powerful tranquilizing drug, or, or, or sometimes cocaine. He would sell them, and it, sometimes in exchange for, for sexual favors, or sometimes, even more menacingly, he would actually abuse them after they were high on drugs. Between 1995 and 2001, a string of complaints are made to police by young girls. But their memories are almost always hazy. Drugs taken unwittingly mean that his victim's evidence is unreliable. Nothing is ever pinned on Belfield. With other even more serious crimes to put before a jury, the sex offences were to remain on the files without further action. I sent a report to the Crown Prosecution Service uh, asking for directions on a series of five uh, drug-induced rapes on teenage girls between the ages of 14 and, and 17. Uh, the evidence wasn't there at that time. In the late 90s, Belfield had begun to apply his intimidating frame to one of his jobs, wheel clamping. He would have no mercy, and no matter who it is, he, his first and only concern is getting the money out of the person. And when he takes on a third job, buying and selling vehicles, he uncovers a car-crushing concern that will become vital to his needs. That was part of his modus operandi, was to, oh, well, we'll have one car one minute, and when we have three cars, or we'll have this car today and that car tomorrow. So if you ever wanted to try and find him, which car were you going to look for? He adds a final chilling element to his methods. The nerve to approach any female, young or old, and ask for sex at any time of the night or day. Levi Belfield was a menace to women. As they drove around in a, a, a white van, he would lean out the window, shout, leer at other women. He would um, wolf whistle, and he would be generally quite unpleasant. Belfield rents a flat in the Walton on Thames area of southwest London. Soon after, a 13 year old schoolgirl, Millie Dowler, goes missing. Oh, <laughs> she fitted his obsession. Millie Dowler went to school but decided to take the train home. She walked out of the station, turned right north to walk home to her parents' house. A girl she vaguely knew was standing waiting for a bus to take her home. She stopped and chatted about the usual things that teenagers chat about. Boys, they recently were planning to go to a gig and they spoke about what they were intending to do at the weekend. At some moment between eight minutes past four and ten minutes past four, on that March afternoon in 2002, she disappeared into thin air. She vanished in the blink of an eye, and just exactly what did happen, what happened to her that, that, that afternoon, was, became a, a great speculation and, and a great deal of fear. The day she went missing, you know, maybe she'd run off, or like everyone else thought, you know, she'd just gone off with friends or something like that, which I think everyone hoped, obviously. Had she run off? Was she with friends? Or had Levi Belfield's obsession claimed its first victim? If they rejected his advances, he would exact a very extreme form of revenge, this hammer attack. Police are searching for Millie Dowler. By 1997, Levi Belfield's second wife, Joe Collings, had taken enough of his beatings. She had left him. 
he soon moves on to wife number three, Emma Mills. On returning home from work on March 22nd, 2002, the day after Millie had gone missing, she sees Belfield doing something he'd never done before, changing the bed. All the bed clothes have been removed. The sheets, the duvet cover, everything. And she says to Levi, what, what's going on here? He said, oh, well, the dog had an accident on the bed. Which she thought was rather strange because the dog was extremely well house trained. But what he was really doing was he was disposing of the mattress that was at the property. Six months after she went missing, late in 2002, the body of Millie Dowler is found 30 miles from the train station where she was last seen. She'd been dumped in woods. Police don't suspect Belfield. The difficulty the police have, or had, was that Millie Dowler, there was absolutely no forensic evidence whatever. There, were no, there was no soft tissue remaining on her body. It was simply bones. Um, no one had seen anything. Not a single witness had seen her go. Belfield was very forensically aware. He knew that if he turned off his mobile phone, they couldn't trace him using triangulation of his mobile phone signal. His phone was off that day for nine and a half hours. You shouldn't underestimate his cunning. He, was, he wasn't educated, but he was very intelligent uh, uh, and, and was cunning enough to think very quickly how to extricate himself from difficulties that he had. That cunning meant that rather than drive a car on the day Millie disappeared registered to his own name, Belfield borrows a friend's. It was a day, Wu. He told me that he lent it to one of his cousins, and I said, well, you better get it back, because I'm fed up with her having my car. And then that night, he came home and told me it had been stolen. Well, we all know now it wasn't, was it? Because he'd been in the buying and selling car business, was also into the scrapping car business. And so he would have been perfectly within his capacity to um, have the car crushed, literally dismantled into tiny parts without a moment's hesitation. Months later, when pouring over street footage, they see the Red Day Wu cruising the area, but they make no connection to Belfield. His name didn't quite come up. Police also didn't know just how well Belfield knew the area where Millie's body had been found. His horse event jumping second wife did. Where Millie's body was found from the horse show was literally walking distance. And when I used to go there and jump, he used to disappear off through the woods. And where he used to walk the dogs was actually the area that they found Millie. But Joe Collins didn't put two and two together, so Levi Belfield had got away with murder, and he still retained his irrational hatred for young blonde girls. February 2003, and a girl is on the way to her home in southwest London. She's blonde. Marshall McDonald was a 18-year-old um, girl. She went with her friends to see a film in Kingston, got the bus home. Marsha could have known nothing of the danger she was in as she neared home. She went out to the cinema with two friends, caught the bus home, got her home just after midnight, about 17, 18 minutes past midnight. She got off the bus and almost made it home. And she was literally you know, ten doors down from where she lived when she was attacked. He was driving along around bus stops where people would get off. So he would perhaps be able to see them when they're on the bus, spy somebody who was on their own, and then when they got off, drive alongside them for a bit before getting out and attacking them. And she was killed about 40 yards from the front door. She was, was hit over the head with something heavy. She died in hospital within hours of the attack. Whoever had killed Marsha had made a rapid getaway in a car, 
which seems simply to have disappeared from the streets. Levi Belfield, once again, has covered his tracks. And he's about to cover his tracks again. This time, after a violent incident when he asks his friend and colleague, Pete Rodriguez, to share a flat and its costs with Levi. He says to me, uh, oh, Pete, come back. I've got some DVDs I want to show you. And I'm going, OK, uh, fair enough. So I've gone, gone back to the flat and stuff. Um, next thing I know, six weeks later, I wake up. Obviously, we had an argument in the flat and stuff. I've gone downstairs. He's followed me, hit me over the head with a mallet. And um, he left me for dead. Within seconds, literally, of it happening, Levi is on the phone with a stage whisper saying other people have committed the crime. Now, we, do, we, we think it was him. Uh, there wasn't enough to charge him with it. As he lies in bed recovering, the confused Rodriguez does not know what has happened. He suddenly gets a visitor, Levi Belfield. He said to the hospital staff, oh, I'm, I'm Peter's brother, I'm going to see him. And he made up a fuss and a commotion and all this and this of it. Yeah, so much so, the actual hospital security escorted him out of the hospital. Belfield's visit to his former friend coincides with an attempt by someone to end Rodriguez's life. He's trying to, trying to come back to turn off the machines, basically, for me. And then like I said, that moment onwards, I had the 24-hour police protection. Police take no further action, not for the first time. They lack evidence. They didn't take my, what I said to them seriously enough. If they had arrested Belfield for the attack on Pete, police may have picked up on the possibility that he was responsible for the disappearance of Millie Dowler. But at this stage of the investigation, in 2003, the only thing the murders of Millie Dowler and Marsha McDowell have in common is the youthfulness of the victims and the fact that they were close to bus stops when last seen. There is no linking DNA, no witnesses, no apparent motive. Police face a tough task. A blitz killer who kills at random is very difficult to track down. The blitz killer is on the loose, unsuspected, and he's on the hunt for another young blonde girl. He just ran all over me. He ran over you twice? Yeah. <laughs> and I really hurt. In 2004, friends of Levi Belfield noticed some odd behavior. He's begun to have a series of panic attacks. On holiday with close friend Richard Hughes, a poster for a murdered Spanish girl causes a strange reaction. Well, the waitress at the table was it? So a 14-year-old girl was murdered yesterday on the beach. And he got up out of that table and left the restaurant. Gone. Psst. When we got back, he was in the hotel. I said, well, what was all that about? He said, oh, I was just having an attack. He said, it must be the heat. In hospital, still recovering from the vicious attack he'd suffered, Pete Rodriguez hears of an horrific attempt on the life of a young blonde girl. A man had randomly driven his car at her. Well, he ran her over and we went back over her and punched her lung. And lucky enough, she survived. Kate Sheedy, again, who had been on a bus late at night, she'd just left school that very day, in fact. Uh, was going home to her parents' house. As she walked up the road, she was aware that there was a, a vehicle parked on her side of the road. It was a people carrier. It was white. It had uh, blacked out windows. And the engine was running, but the lights were off. And she... It was a sixth sense, really. She, she, she wasn't sure why she was frightened of this vehicle, but she knew she was. This time it was a Toyota people carrier that was caught on CCTV cameras at the local pub. He simply turned the car rapidly in a U-turn. Drove over. And then backed over her again, just for good measure. He stopped 
in between the wheels of the, of the car. It then reversed, so the front wheel went over her again. With a punctured lung and struggling for every breath, Kate manages to make a call to emergency services. It's the most moving piece of tape you could want to listen to. She had every rib broken, she had a spleen ruptured, she had damage to her spine, she had you know, horrific injuries. But was very, very tough, very spirited and, 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 and got through it all. Pete, recovering from the attack he'd suffered, suddenly realises when that incident had happened. And I think that was the same day as when he came to see me in the hospital. Rodriguez consults a map. So far, he's realised that someone's killed Millie Dowler in a place called Walton-on-Thames. Marsha McDonnell is murdered near Twickenham, and a young girl has been targeted near the hospital where Rodriguez is recovering. On each of the occasions, Belfield's been nearby. I felt uh, it was too many for coincidences. The one in, in Twickenham, well, Joe lived two minutes away from, from that one. One in, in uh, Walton, again, because of the flat in Walton Bridge, and he liked to fish off the Walton Bridge. It's a bit of a coincidence. Millie Dale got abducted under Walton Bridge. That particular area of southwest London, he knew literally like the back of his hand. Every runnel, alleyway, lake, golf course, factory site, industrial area, shop, he'd literally driven over them all. It is not a matter of going far and wide and jumping off a bus and saying, oh, I think I'll kill someone here. It's a matter of being at home in the area. <laughs> Joe Collings, like Pete Rodriguez before her, knew that the attacks and murders were happening in areas known to Levi. And she knew something else. An appeal for information made by police about the white people carrier rings a bell. And I saw, you know, the white people carrier it's really hard to explain to someone when you you just know yourself but you don't you think no come on it's not really and i phoned his friend who was a really good friend of mine and i said levi's got the white people carry hasn't he and he was like yeah why and i said you know you just don't want to believe it so belfield remains unsuspected A French student is out on the town. She'll soon need a bus ride home. She'd been with some friends at a wine bar in Twickenham. She'd had three or four glasses of wine. Decided to go home about half past nine. Got the bus and she somehow managed to miss her stop. She asked the bus driver, you know, when's the next bus back? And he said, across the road, it'll be 10 minutes. And it was a fine evening in August and fatefully she decided she was going to walk. She's blonde, she's young, 22, uh, everything to live for. And as she walks up the road, another car appears. Levi Belfield has chosen his next victim. She was, I don't know, a few hundred yards from home when she was attacked. Levi Belfield is cruising the streets of London. He spots a girl later identified as Amélie Delagrange, a French student. Levi Belfield drove his car alongside her, perhaps spoke to her a number of times, perhaps made approaches to her of a sexual nature or an unpleasant nature, and she may well have carried, carried on up the hill trying to ignore him. But Belfield is tenacious. He stalks his prey. One of the theories behind his motivation would be that these girls rejected his advances, that he may well have followed them for a while, spoken to them, and they would have become scared and asked, them, asked this guy to please go away. And then what he would have done, he would have exacted a very brutal and rapid form of revenge, and that was a smack on the back of the head with a hammer, a blunt object of some form. It was incredibly violent. 
she was just found. There was a student who was um, getting some air while he was doing revision or something, walked out and walked around the green and found what he thought was a, a drunk and then realised that she had this, this horrific wound on the back of her head. Um, and he raised the alarm and she, she died very quickly. She died the same evening. The menacing element behind the Amelie de la Grange murder is that horrendous moment of a girl in a foreign country encountering someone who was that aggressive towards her and that menacing and that intimidating. And she must have been petrified, knowing that this bloke was somewhere had been earlier on that unpleasant to her. This memorial bench and oak tree marks the area near to where Amélie de Lagrange's bloody body was found. One more girl, one more blonde victim to Levi Belfield. Police still do not suspect him as the man causing panic on the streets. There was a real palpable feeling of, of fear amongst particularly the, the women and girls in, in South West London at that time because there's a maniac on the loose. He was simply killing blonde young women for pleasure. And it is, it is almost beyond understanding why anyone, any human being, could bring themselves to do that and literally to treat it as though it was nothing more than opening a tin of beans or walking out the front door. But Belfield's latest murder has given police a vital clue. They notice a white van. We then went wider into our CCTV that we'd seized and found that this van was actually driving round Twickenham Green for something like three quarters of an hour before Emily was murdered. And we say hunting, looking, looking, for, looking for prey, almost. Police linked the van to Levi Belfield. He did wheel clamping in a, in a white van, and, and this uh, guy says, I sold the van to somebody called Levi who wants to do for wheel clamping. Out of the blue, Belfield visits his second wife and reveals a tortured state of mind. He said, I've done something. He said, and what I've done, if you won't forgive me, only God can forgive me. And I was like, yeah, you know, thinking John McQueen. And he's like, no, seriously, he said, you, you, won't, um, you won't believe it when you find out. But Belfield doesn't reveal precisely what she might find out. You sort of start thinking, it's all a little bit, it's bits just get, you know, you start putting things into perspective and things like that. And then that's when I went to the police, went down to the Twickenham Green and to the crime unit. And I said to them, you know, about Levi, and they just took all the details and what have you. And like, yeah, we'll get back to you. Thank you for that. What makes you think it was him? And I said, you know, it was his, just his pure hatred of blondes. And the fact that everyone who had been killed or missing or attacked were all blondes. But it's a more minor detail in Joe Collins' description of Levi Belfield, which raises police interest. The real key to it was, she, she said he now drives a little white van and does wheel clamping. So we had our suspect, and um, the following evening, we were looking for the van and looking for him, and, and we had a, a surveillance team um, behind Levi Belfield 24-7. It is three years since the disappearance of Millie Dowler. Since then, there have been multiple unsolved rape cases in the same area, two murders and an attempted killing. Police are watching a man now known to the media as the bus stop stalker when he seems set to attack again. One Sunday, Levi is out in uh, another of his vehicles. There are two girls standing at a standing at bus stop waiting for the bus and Levi pulls over and gets out and uh, goes up and speaks to them. It turned out these two girls were cousins and uh, Levi had asked them how old they were and they said 14 and 15 and he'd said, oh, I bet, oh, I bet you're virgins, I bet you're, you're nice, and, nice and fresh or something like this. Levi Belfield is still on the loose, looking for new prey. Little does he realise that the police are now watching his every move. The speed with which we thought these attacks took place, it was... There was a risk 
that we would have another murder with, with nine police officers watching it and in fact videoing it, but unable to intervene because of the speed it happened. After 10 days of surveillance, police move in to arrest Levi Belfield. He makes a break for it. He ran up and hid in the loft. He was naked and was hiding under the insulation. So he was arrested and taken to, um, to Heathrow Police Station, uh, where we had to start to try to interview him. All this similar stuff's coming up, isn't it? Blondes, buses, Levi's cars. Yeah? So maybe we need we'll boots the line to say why. Leave enough for dead. No comment. 18 years old. No comment. Yeah? Like that. Because something's gone in Levi's head. That's what's happened, mate. It is. It is. Too many similarities, Levi. Too many similarities for the question not to be asked and for you not to say why. No comment. No comment. Because you can't say anything, can you? No comment. Nothing can justify it, can it? Belfield is eventually charged with the murders of Amélie de Lagrange, Marsha MacDonald and the attempted murder of Kate Sheedy. He is found guilty and sentenced to life in prison. After his capture, the streets of southwest London have once again become a safe place. But there's still a mystery about the death of Millie Dowler. Two years into Belfield's prison sentence, and the investigating officer is reviewing Millie's case. All of a sudden, I'm looking at what we now know about Levi Belfield and, and, and reading it in his intelligence report about the, you know, his liking for young girls. And he lived on exactly the spot where, 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 where Millie Dowler was last seen. Well, actually, this might be something in this. Police pluck him from his cell, but any notion that he might admit to killing Millie or show remorse is quickly dismissed. They quiz him about his whereabouts on the day she went missing. They remind him that he inexplicably ripped sheets from the bed before getting rid of them, something which had aroused the suspicions of his then wife. Belfield simply did not do housework. Was he just destroying evidence? Do you honestly believe that your actions over the 21st and the 22nd of March 2002 the actions of an innocent man. No Once he was identified to them, they had, it took them six and a half years to get the evidence together to convict him. And are you an innocent man? No because if you are, tell us. No and give us that explanation for where you were and what you were doing. No are you able to do that, Levi? No the most striking thing about Levi Belfort was his eyes. It just had the darkest, coldest, unflickering eyes that you just look into them and there was just, there was just nothing. The most dangerous, the most odd character I think I've ever come across. When Levi was eventually brought before court for the murder of Millie Dowler, Steve Bird witnessed at first hand just how intimidating the bouncer and wheel clamper could be. During the Millie Dowler trial, the jury decamped and they all head in a bus to uh, the site where Millie Dial had uh, disappeared. One of the uh, members of the press was a long-haired blonde lady. And it was quite a horrendous moment because at one point he turned and looked at this uh, blonde-haired girl, very similar perhaps in appearance to the victims he targeted, and he winked at her. And again, just a slightly menacing element to his character that he would s stop stare at her, wink, smile. And this girl was quite clearly upset by this, you know, that this bloke who was already convicted of a double murder was the kind of guy who thought that he might just be able to wink at a girl and intimidate her. In 2010, Levi Belfield was eventually found guilty of the murder of 13-year-old Millie Dowler. Unfortunately, she was in the wrong place at the wrong time. 
And like I said, if it wasn't her, he de it would have been another schoolgirl. In a bizarre twist, his murders would also become involved in Britain's biggest newspaper scandal and the fall of the part of one of the world's mightiest news organisations. One of their investigators had hacked into Millie Dowler's phone whilst she was missing, murdered by Levi. The fact that Millie Dowler's phone was hacked by the News of the World and the Murdoch newspapers in this country is disgraceful, outrageous. Every single person who discovered it, once it became public knowledge, is naturally horrified. The irony that this is a man who does not deserve any public sympathy whatever, and yet may indeed have helped to cause the end of one of the most popular and much loved uh, British Sunday newspapers. That's what's happened, mate. Right? It is. As for Levi's motives, police and experts can still only speculate. While there's no doubting his guilt, nobody can be sure of the reason for his pure hatred of young blonde females. No comment. I believe that Levi Belfield, rather like the Moore's murderer Ian Brady, will never tell anyone what he did to Millie Dowler. I believe he took her off the street that day. I believe your motivation was sexual. And I believe he took her back to Collingwood Place. And I believe he killed her there. That's the truth, isn't it? No comment. He believes that knowledge and his secrets are power. Power over everybody, including the parents of the victims, everyone. But some believe there are other unanswered questions out there, like the murder of Patsy Morris, who just so happened to be a 14-year-old school friend of Levi Belfield. When he was 14, or at least in, in, around that age, uh, one of his school friends, a girl called Patsy Morris, uh, died in rather unusual circumstances. Police obviously looked at him as a character. Would it be that this guy who had carried out, has been convicted now of three murders, how far back does his uh, uh, pattern of offending and crimes against girls uh, go? One theory is that he's now being ruled out, but you have to wonder, is there a possibility his, his offending dates back to then? When he was first arrested, um, he was charged with eight rapes, although those charges were never followed through because of the murders overtook them. For those up close with Belfield, his life sentence brought an end to a chapter that they still find confusing. Obviously, if we knew then what you know now, I wouldn't have nothing to do with man. Unfortunately, you don't have a sign on your head saying a murderer or, or schizo or whatever like that, you know? Even to this day, I can't. I can't figure out why. Was it something in his childhood or did he just have a thing against women? He was someone who preyed on the most vulnerable in society. Firstly, women. Secondly, girls. I mean, these were, these were girls who should have been safe as they walked home from school, should have been safe as they walked home with a short distance from a bus stop. He, he was violent, uh, predatory, and somebody for whom we don't quite understand the motivation. Unfortunately, I dealt with, you know, the, the, the dregs of humanity for, for 30 years. Uh, no one's like Levi. Nobody had a disregard for authority, for other people, for just humanity. The things that he did, and I know he did, that he won't ever be prosecuted for or, 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 or have to account for, uh, are just, just shocking. It's truly, truly shocking, and uh, no, there's no one, there's no one to blame as Levi. Levi Evil, um, he is an anagram of his name. And I said, Levi's got the white people carry, hasn't he? And he was like, yeah, why? And I said, you know, you just don't want to believe it. 
so Belfield remains unsuspected. A French student is out on the town. She'll soon need a bus ride home. She'd been with some friends at a wine bar in Twickenham. She'd had three or four glasses of wine. Decided to go home about half past nine. Got the bus and she somehow managed to miss her stop. She asked the bus driver, you know, when's the next bus back? And he said, across the road, it'll be 10 minutes. And it was a fine evening in August and fatefully she decided she was going to walk. She's blonde, she's young, 22, uh, everything to live for. And as she walks up the road, another car appears. Levi Belfield has chosen his next victim. She was, I don't know, a few hundred yards from home when she was attacked. Levi Belfield, she was missing, murdered by Levi. The fact that Millie Dowler's phone was hacked by the News of the World and the Murdoch newspapers in this country is disgraceful, outrageous. Every single person who discovered it, once it became public knowledge, is naturally horrified. The irony that this is a man who does not deserve any public sympathy whatever, and yet may indeed have helped to cause the end of one of the most popular and much loved uh, British Sunday newspapers. That's what's happened, mate. Right? It is. As for Levi's motives, police and experts can still only speculate. While there's no doubting his guilt, nobody can be sure of the reason for his pure hatred of young blonde females. No comment. No comment. I believe that Levi Belfield, rather like the Moore's murderer Ian Brady, will never tell anyone what he did to Millie Dowler. I believe he took her off the street that day. I believe your motivation was sexual. And I believe he took her back to Collingwood Place. And I believe he killed her there. That's the truth, isn't it? No comment. He believes that knowledge and his secrets are power. Power over everybody, including the parents of the victims, everyone. But some believe there are other unanswered questions out there, like the murder of Patsy. So Belfield remains unsuspected. A French student is out on the town. She'll soon need a bus ride home. She'd been with some friends at a wine bar in Twickenham. She'd had three or four glasses of wine. Decided to go home about half past nine got the bus and she somehow managed to miss her stop. She asked the bus driver, you know, when's the next bus back? And he said, across the road, it'll be 10 minutes. And it was a fine evening in August and fatefully she decided she was going to walk. She's blonde, she's young, 22, uh, everything to live for. And as she walks up, the road, another car appears. Levi Belfield has chosen his next victim. She was, I don't know, a few hundred yards from home when she was attacked. Levi Belfield is cruising the streets of London. He spots a girl later identified as Amélie Delagrange, a French student. Levi Belfield drove... Any human being could bring themselves to do that and literally to treat it as though it was nothing more than opening a tin of beans or walking out the front door. But Belfield's latest murder has given police a vital clue. They notice a white van. We then went wider into our CCTV that we'd seized and found that this van was actually driving round Twickenham Green for something like three quarters of an hour before Emily was murdered. And we say hunting, looking, looking, for, looking for prey almost. 
police linked the van to Levi Belfield. He did wheel clamping in a, in a white van, and, and this uh, guy says, I sold the van to somebody called Levi who wants to do it for wheel clamping. Out of the blue, Belfield visits his second wife and reveals a tortured state of mind. He said, I've done something. He said, and what I've done, if you won't forgive me, only God can forgive me. And I was like, yeah, you know, thinking John McQueen. And he's like, no, seriously, he said, you, you, won't, um, you won't believe it when you find out. But Belfield doesn't reveal precisely what she might find out. You sort of start thinking, it's all a little bit, it's bits just get, you know, you start putting things into perspective and... A violent incident when he asks his friend and colleague, Pete Rodriguez, to share a flat and its costs with Levi. He says to me, uh, oh, Pete, come back. I've got some DVDs I want to show you. And I'm going, OK, uh, fair enough. So I've gone, gone back to the flat and stuff. Um, next thing I know, six weeks later, I wake up. Obviously, we had an argument in the flat and stuff. I've gone downstairs. He's followed me, hit me over the head with a mallet. And um, he left me for dead. Within seconds, literally, of it happening, Levi is on the phone with a stage whisper saying other people have committed the crime. Now, we, do, we, we think it was him. Uh, there wasn't enough to charge him with it. As he lies in bed recovering, the confused Rodriguez does not know what has happened. He suddenly gets a visitor, Levi Belfield. He said to the hospital staff, oh, I'm, I'm Peter's brother. I'm going to see him. And he made up a fuss and a commotion and all this and this of it. Yeah, so much so, the actual hospital security escorted him out of the hospital. Belfield's visit to his former friend coincides with an attempt by someone to end Rodriguez's life. He's trying to, trying to come back to turn off the machines, basically, for me. And then I said that moment on... Man had randomly driven his car at her. Well, he ran her over and we went back over her and punctured her lung. And lucky enough, she survived. Kate Sheedy, again, who had been on a bus late at night, she'd just left school that very day, in fact, uh, was going home to her parents' house. As she walked up the road, she was aware that there was a, a vehicle parked on her side of the road. It was a people carrier. It was white. It had uh, blacked out windows. And the engine was running, but the lights were off. And she... It was a sixth sense, really. She, she, she wasn't sure why she was frightened of this vehicle, but she knew she was. This time it was a Toyota people carrier that was caught on CCTV cameras at the local pub. He simply turned the car rapidly in a U-turn, drove over, and then backed over her again, just for good measure. He stopped in between the wheels of the, of the car. It then reversed, so the front wheel went over her again. With a punctured lung and struggling for every breath, Kate manages to make a call to emergency services. <laughs> Where does it hurt? Well, I had the 24-hour police protection. Police take no further action, not for the first time, they lack evidence. They didn't take my, what I said to them seriously enough. If they had arrested Belfield for the attack on Pete, police may have picked up on the possibility that he was responsible for the disappearance of Millie Dowler. But at this stage of the investigation, in 2003, the only thing the murders of Millie Dowler and Marsha McDowell have in common is the youthfulness of the victims and the fact that they were close to bus stops when last seen. There is no linking DNA, no witnesses, no apparent motive. Police face a tough task. A blitz killer who kills at random is very difficult to track down. The blitz killer is on the loose, unsuspected, and he's on the hunt for another young blonde girl. He just ran all over me. He ran over you twice. Yeah. <laughs> Really 
In 2004, friends of Levi Belfield noticed some odd behavior. He's begun to have a series of panic attacks. On holiday with close friend Richard Hughes, a poster for a murdered Spanish girl causes a strange... Belfield would never stand trial for some of the offenses he was alleged to have committed against young girls. He would leave no DNA trace as he forced himself on some of the girls that he comes across. He was someone who kept a mattress in the back of one of his vans whereby he would sometimes ply girls with ketamine, a very powerful tranquilizing drug, or, or, or sometimes cocaine he would sell them, and it, sometimes in exchange for, for sexual favors, or sometimes, even more menacingly, he would actually abuse them after they were high on drugs. Between 1995 and 2001, a string of complaints are made to police by young girls. But their memories are almost always hazy. Drugs taken unwittingly mean that his victim's evidence is unreliable. Nothing is ever pinned on Belfield. With other even more serious crimes to put before a jury, the sex offences were to remain on the files without further action. I sent a report to the Crown Prosecution Service uh, asking for directions on a series of five uh, drug-induced rapes on teenage girls between the ages of 14 and, and 17. Uh, the evidence wasn't there at that time. In the late 90s, Belfield had begun to apply his intimidating frame to one of his jobs, wheel clamping. He had looked at him as a character. Would it be that this guy who had carried out, has been convicted now of three murders, how far back does his uh, uh, pattern of offending and crimes against girls uh, go? One theory is that he's now being ruled out, but you have to wonder, is there a possibility his, his offending dates back to then? When he was first arrested, um, he was charged with eight rapes although those charges were never followed through because of the murders overtook them. For those up close with Belfield, his life sentence brought an end to a chapter that they still find confusing. Obviously, if we knew then what you know now, I wouldn't have nothing to do with the man. Unfortunately, you don't have a sign on your head saying a murderer or, or schizo or whatever like that, you know? Even to this day, I can't, can't figure out why. Was it something in his childhood, or did he just have a thing against women? He was someone who preyed on the most vulnerable in society. Firstly, women. Secondly, girls. I mean, these were, these were girls who should have been safe as they walked home from school, should have been safe as they walked home with a short distance from a bus stop. He, he was violent, uh, predatory, and somebody for whom we don't quite understand the motivation. At the area. Pete Rodriguez was to become a pivotal figure in Belfield's life as a friend and a colleague. I haven't got no brothers or sisters or anything like that. Uh, maybe it's subconsciously knowing I've got a bigger sort of brother, in a sense, looking out for you, you know, because that's the impression he give you. He'll be looking out for you. But Rodriguez would soon carry the scars, emotionally and physically, of having Levi Belfield as an older brother figure. There are deeply unsettling sides to Levi, which occasionally appear. After a couple of drinks, he would get aggressive. He'd start off enjoyable, then he end up being a nightmare. He rather goes to try and beat up somebody. Belfield takes that aggression home. His first wife leaves him after one particularly savage beating, and his next partner quickly sees the steroid-induced muscle man's violent side. I bite you, burn you, kick you, punch you. Remember he split the back of my head open once, because he was fixing, doing something to the car, and I didn't answer him quickly enough and he had a tool in his hand and he just turned around and as I walked away, he hit me straight in the back of the head and split all my head open down there. That was one of the times. Particularly unsettling for Joe is her husband's irrational hatred of blonde women. Richard's state of mind. He said, I've done something. He said, and what I've done, if you won't forgive me, only God can forgive me. And I was like, yeah, you know, thinking, Joe, I'm a queen. And he's like, no, seriously, he said, you, 
you won't um, you won't believe it when you find out. But Belfield doesn't reveal precisely what she might find out. You sort of start thinking it's all a little bit. It's bits just get you know you start putting things into perspective and things like that. And then that's when I went to the police, went down to the Twickenham Green and to the crime unit, and I said to them, you know, about Levi. And they just took all the details and what have you. And like, yeah, we'll get back to you. Thank you for that. What makes you think it was him? And I said, you know, it was his, just his pure hatred of blondes. And the fact that everyone who had been killed or missing or attacked were all blondes. But it's a more minor detail in Joe Collins' description of Levi Belfield, which raises police interest. The real key to it was, she, she said he now drives a little white van and does wheel clamping. So we had our suspect, and um, the following evening, we were looking for the van and looking for him, and, and we had a, a surveillance team um, behind Levi Belfield 24-7. It 